Okay, well, you know how I like to start. Good morning, church. Um, I want to welcome again, I want you to welcome with me my wild YWAM bunches here visiting. Give them a hand. Love you guys so much. It really means a lot. Uh, we, I had a week with them teaching the word. It was so special. And uh, it did kind of become like family to me such, in a such quick period of time. So we love you. Um, I'm a happy pastor today. Not just because, you know, the church is packed or, you know, it, it's a good day, which is going to be a good day. And I think the word is going to be very fruitful today. But I'm a happy pastor. You know why? Because we, after four and a half months, we have a drummer in our worship band. And uh, we are so thankful, Dennis, for you doing it. Um, would you not say that worship was awesome today? So it's going to be a good Sunday. Welcome to the Church of the Outer Banks. Um, I do want you to pray as we continue to grow. We have decisions that we have to make, and they're not easy. But uh, I just want to say glory to God that he is bringing people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And we should be always grateful and thankful. So today, let's get to work. We're continuing our uh, study in the book of Philippians. And sadly, we're coming to an end here in the book of Philippians. Has anyone in this crowd enjoyed this study in Philippians? Um, it's been incredibly transformational in my life, and my prayer is, has been for you. So today we're in the second half of chapter 4, and Paul is penning one of his most famous scripture in all letters. We're going to be reading it together later. It's Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. And you're going to be learning today that the proper context surrounding this verse, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the important I would say all important, subject of contentment, okay? So contentment, being content is going to be the subject of today's sermon. And I think it's, this week, it's been incredibly challenging in my own life, asking myself questions. Have I learned to be content? in any and every situation? Is my life marked by running and chasing bigger, better, more? Or have I learned, as Paul says, the secret of being content? So yes, this will be a challenging message. It should be. But you should be able to come to church and allow the Holy Spirit to sometimes do surgery because I believe this is a message that we need to hear, specifically a message we need to hear in our country. But Paul is challenging believers to cultivate a life marked by contentment. In his own words, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. That we are supposed to grow in the virtue of contentment. And in many ways, we don't always come to church and hear a message about contentment. In some ways, theologians will say it's a forgotten virtue. Sometimes we don't think about it enough. Why do we do that? Because it's challenging. And it's not something that comes easy. And that's why Paul said I had to learn it. Meaning that I have to put my flesh into submission and learn Contentment. And I would say in many ways, it's a sign of spiritual maturity. When I see someone in the body of Christ that I look up to, someone I want to model my life after, a lot of times they have a characteristic of contentment. And it's powerful. And it speaks. And I wonder what, where you are in this journey with contentment. Paul is talking to his young confidant, Timothy, like his son in the faith. And he says in 1 Timothy 6, 6, he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. He's saying part of being content, 
Godliness with contentment is treasure. You know, and uh, 18th century founding father Benjamin Franklin says this. He said, contentment makes poor man rich, and discontentment makes rich men poor. So if we're honest, we're living, we're learning, learning contentment is quite a challenge in our culture. I mean, John Steinbuck in his book, he says, we can shoot rockets into space, but we can't cure discontentment. We're living in an age of discontent. Uh, historians will say our society is marked by an extinguishable discontent. And this discontent, this dissatisfaction, church can be destructive in our life. It can lead us on a never-ending quest for bigger, for better, and for more. Where we're never satisfied, where we take the mantra, the grass is always greener on the other side. So this mentality, I was thinking about this this week, if I just had this, or how about this one? If I could just relocate, then I would have satisfaction. If I could just move to the beach, then all my problems will be solved. How true is that? She says amen. They're actually looking for a house right now. There's so many. I grew up here. Do you know how many people on vacation have come up to me and said, if I could just move to the beach, all these things would take care of themselves, and I would be fully satisfied. So my wife and I, we go back in these funny TikToks, okay? We do this for fun. She sees funny TikToks. She sends them to me. And this is a really, I think, a really funny TikTok, which, which this, this guy is talking about to his wife, if we just got to the beach. And I want you to enjoy it. Um, it's, just, it's just a minute. You can hit the lights. Um, I think um, there's some truth to this. Uh, look, I know we talked a lot about it while we were down there, and I've literally been thinking about it every single day. I think we should move to the beach. <laughs> Like, we could literally sell all of our possessions and put the house up for sale. We could probably afford that $7 million house we saw online while we were down there. <laughs> no, I think we could do it. I think we could. We would just have to budget really good. And, like, we wouldn't need much because, like, you're living on the beach. You know what I mean? And you loved that coffee shop. Like, you loved, like, tell me that coffee wasn't the best coffee we ever had in our life. We could have that every single day. All the lunches and the dinners that we had on the beach. Doesn't that sound amazing? Just think how healthy we would be. Fresh seafood. We would work out every single day. No, like I know I don't work out now, but I would literally go walking and running on the beach every single day. My mental health would be so in check. Like I'm living on the beach. I think we should do it. I really think we should. You had such a blast making seashell necklaces with the kids. Just think about it. You could do that every single day. And you remember how nice everyone was? Oh, all the locals would welcome us with open arms. Seriously. Should we do it? Should we call up the mortgage person? I think we should do it. You know what? YOLO. <laughs> Isn't that good? I love it. I love it. He talks about um, if we move to the beach, we're going to work out every day. And the locals, they're going to be so nice to us. We all know different. But it's funny. If we move to the beach... Living at the beach can't heal our dissatisfaction. If you don't believe me, go to Walmart in the summer. Get in traffic. We're not healed by relocating. Our problems follow us wherever we go. Choosing Satisfaction Church in people, things, and places is an endless pursuit. If you're with me, someone say amen. Amen. The wisest man outside of Christ that ever lived, his name was Solomon. And Solomon wrote about wisdom. God gave him the gift of wisdom. And 3,000 years ago, he was talking about the same thing that we're talking about today. And he used all his wisdom. He spent his whole life acquiring everything that he thought he wanted. He went from more to bigger to better. And as he watched all the people on earth and how they toiled for satisfaction, he said these words. He said, trying to find satisfaction in anything other than God, in his words, were a chasing after 
the wind. And I was thinking about how much wisdom this is. That this pursuit, it leaves us empty-handed. Jeremiah has a beautiful metaphor, and he says, this chasing is like a broken cistern that the more you try to fill it up, it will never get full. And that's why one of my favorite quotes of all time, I know you're going to think it's a Spurgeon quote, but it isn't. It's Church Father St. Augustine, and he said this. He says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Sometimes as a pastor, we just want to take a moment and I want you to soak this in. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. So, I want you to know that the answer to your discontent, it's not bigger It's not better. It's not more. The answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer, and it's found in Christ and Christ alone. And this is what Paul is teaching us in this verse. Where is our discontent satisfied? In Jesus. And this is, if you can leave today, the sermon, and you could hear those words, it has been a good Sunday. So would you turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 4, and you know I like to do, let's see how we did today, there is a big crowd, who brought their Bibles? What do we say? That's awesome. Don't you hold up your tablet back there? No, I'm kidding. These high school kids are holding up their cell phones. By the way, high school, I'm so happy that you're here. I am so happy that we have rows and rows of high school students. I'm paying them to laugh at every one of my jokes. Um, So, okay, so let's dig in here, church. Let's dig in. Turn to Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I'm going to put it on PowerPoint, even though I think it's lazy, because you're not looking at your own Bible. Um... I'm going to be a brat today, and I'm not going to take it off, so you actually have to look at a Bible. Or you know what? You're right. I need to act in some grace. I, I need to be more gracious. Can I be content with you guys not bringing Bibles? No. All right. Settle down. Here we go. Let me read it to you. So if, you, if you're not a visual person, maybe you can just hear the word of the Lord. This is Paul in Philippians 4, and he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Here it is. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My prayer is that you never read Philippians 4.13 again because it's one of the most misinterpreted scriptures actually in all, all the Bible. You have to read it in context. The point that Paul's making here is contentment. So verse 13, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. And this is powerful. We have to take a minute and pause here. Where is Paul writing these words from? Prison. You have learned that for the last 10 weeks. He is, I want you to get a mental picture here. He is chained 24 hours a day to a Roman guard. In the natural, he appears to be lacking. Chained to a guard. He's beaten. He was starved. He was tortured. And I'm talking this has been two years. 
or even more at the time he wrote this letter. He's a wait, awaiting a trial with a Caesar who is getting more and more bloodthirsty against Christians. He had an uncertain future. And he, in the middle of this, he is penning these words. There are no greater circumstances for discontent than this. This church is an atmosphere that would breed discontent. And this leads us to our biblical definition of contentment. Contentment is the state of being satisfied, independent. Can you say that word to me? Independent of external circumstances. Paul says, I'm actually in the worst situation I could imagine. And if I was Paul, I'd probably be pretty ticked off too because he had the greatest ministry going. He was, he was building churches. They were growing. They were expanding. And he, he has this moment where he could sit there and say, I'm not satisfied. His ministry was put on hold. But he said, no, that is not the definition of contentment. He's saying, I had plenty. I want you to know that Paul at the beginning of his life, he went to the best schools. He was highly educated. He was influential. He was, one of the, he was going to be one of the great Pharisees. Paul was a Roman citizen. He knew what it was to have plenty. And then he became a Christian, and he learned that he had he'd been in need. At this time, he's beaten, he's starving, he's isolated. And he's learning contentment in every situation. Paul says, it's not what's around me, it's what's in me. You with me, church? I'm in the worst circumstances possible, but it's not what's around me, it's what's in me. And this made the difference in his life. He said, and I think this is very interesting if, you're, if you like to teach line by line through Scripture. He said, I have learned to be content. And this is powerful because contentment's not a gift. It's not just something that when you become a Christian, you automatically are content. That's not the case at all here. He said, I've learned it. It's a process. And if you have to learn something, it means it doesn't come naturally. It's not in our nature. We are not born content. And if you have children, you understand this, don't we? They're not born content. And it's human nature to always want more. It's in our nature to covet, to envy, and it's in our nature to never be satisfied. In the resounding words of the great rock theologian, Mick Jagger, he has a song that I think is appropriate. You can finish it with me. I can't get no. Mm. Wow, Gigi, you wanted that one yourself, didn't you? Okay, let's see if you guys can keep going. I can't get no. Da -da -da. What's next? And I try. All right, there's one section over here that likes the stones. What is, what is Mick Jagger saying? What is he saying? He's saying what Solomon is saying. That Jagger had everything. Their band was exploding. All the money in the world. But the harder he tries, and he tries, and he tries, he can't find contentment. It's the anthem of the human heart. It's human nature. Advertisements spend billions of dollars trying to feed our discontent, reminding that we never have enough. Commercials, billboards, advertisements, and they all say basically this, you deserve more. You deserve better. That annoying priority Toyota you can have it all. You know that one? It led, I know I can't sing. <laughs> this is why I don't sing. It led me to go out and buy a forerunner. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
That is the resounding call of advertisement. You deserve more. You deserve better. And I want, I want to remind you something. Discontentment is not new. This is not a new thing. I want to take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Okay? Go all the way back to Genesis with me. What sin was committed in the garden? Was it violence? No. It wasn't adultery? It wasn't lying. Adam and Eve had everything they wanted, yet they still wanted more. Am I preaching to anyone? They wandered. Don't you wonder how long it took them to get discontented with paradise? Paradise. Perfect communion with God. They had everything that they could ever want following God. Adam had a beautiful wife. He was the most handsome man on the planet at the time. Okay, he was the only man. Can you imagine being the most handsome man on the planet? She said, amen. No sickness, no disease, no traffic, no target, nothing. It was paradise. How could you get tired of that? Everything they needed. God was sufficient, and they still wanted more. Let me read it to you. When the woman saw the, that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Church, this is a biblical picture of discontentment. They were in the presence of God, the all-sufficient presence of God, and they still had an appetite for more. How do you handle these appetites? How you handle these appetites, they make all the difference. John D. Rockefeller, I've told you this before, he was the founder of Standard Oil Company. He was the first billionaire in the United States, the richest man on earth at that time, the first billionaire the United States have ever seen. He had it all, and they asked him that question that maybe you've heard before. How much money is enough, John? And he replied, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And let me tell you, something that fuels discontent unlike anything else is this idea of comparison. You agree with me on that? I'm here to tell you that if you're a note taker, take this down. When comparison begins, contentment ends. And I was thinking about this discontentment trap, um, and this is what contentment, discontentment looks like. It's the if-only trap. Have you ever said in your life, if only I had this? If only I had 10,000 more dollars. If only I had a bigger house. I mean, if only I lived in Kitty Hawk. Listen, I got my wish. I moved to Kitty Hawk, and it floods every single storm. <laughs> if only I had a husband. And I'm going to say no comment on that one. If only I had children. And now we're saying, if only they were nice to me. And this is mine, and I'm bearing my soul because this is what I do. Uh, if only I had a boat. This is totally me. I have boat envy. I saw this bumper stickers. I love big boats, and I cannot lie. I'm just telling you, that's me. I convinced myself that boats, a new boat would change my life. I actually, I went home one day and told Kimber it was going to make me a better husband. You think I'm kidding. 
It's, I have so much boat envy that I eat lunch at Country Deli as much as I can. I don't know if you've ever been to Country Deli, but it's right across the street from Outer Banks Boats. And I sit there and I just wish. The new colors come in and I'm eating my lunch and I am full of envy. And the algorithms, they know my envy because every time I pick up my phone, there's a boat on Instagram. And it gets worse. And then I have a church full of beautiful people that have these awesome boats. And I want to tell you I'm spiritual and I'm happy for you, but I'm not. And they have these boats. And want to know what the worst thing is? Sometimes I'll, I'll get to church early because I'm on setup on Sunday, and I see some of my beloved members towing their boats, beeping and waving at me. And I want to I want to say that I want I want to in my heart say bless you brother have fun, but what I'm really thinking is you're so annoying. I hope you don't catch any fish today because you miss church. I can't believe I bear my soul to you guys. Envy, according to Proverbs, rots the bones. Let me give you that scripture so you guys can go home and memorize it. Proverbs 14.30 says it like this. A, pe a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And I was thinking about, we have this thing called social media, and it's the comparison trap of all traps. It fuels our envy and leads us to discontent. And we feel lesser because we don't have more. It's an ancient tool from Satan. We feel lesser because we don't have more. I was reading this book this week, and I thought this was very judicious, this quote. And I think it's very true, even in the body of Christ. Envy is resenting God's goodness in someone else's life all the while ignoring his goodness in our own lives. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? When you see someone get something that you wanted, we need to have the pasture, the posture of joy for them. Because what we're doing is we're forgetting about the goodness in our own and you don't need to ever get anything else in your life, then you need to remember the gospel that Jesus left heaven to come to earth. You deserved death, but through faith in Christ, you have life. And you need, to, and that goodness is enough. It's enough. You, you don't even deserve that, not even close. God is not holding out on you. He's giving you his best, eternal life. If you're grateful, someone say amen. amen. Don't buy into Satan's trap. You deserve more. You deserve better. The scriptures say you deserve death. But because of his great mercy, he's given us life. And if I can stay in that area, if I can stay in that level of contentment, that everything I have is a gift from God, if I can remember his goodness in my life, it can heal my discontent. Okay, we're doing good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick it up here. We wanna finish. I wanna look at the solution to our discontentment, okay? He gives us the solution to our discontentment. This is verses 12 and 13. Um, he says, I have... I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. 
Philippians 4.13 is one of the most misinterpreted verses in all the Bible. We use it as athletic mantra. Every athlete, every gym, every tattoo has this. We use it as this magical mantra that I will be guaranteed success in everything I do. That anything that I do, if I tack this verse onto it, any plan I have is going to succeed. That is not the context of 413. This is not a motivational quote. Paul's in prison. Paul is saying he can do anything. He's not saying he can do anything he puts his mind to. That's out of context. The way that we like to say it is I can do all things. That's not it. It's a declaration. The true context, church, is no matter what I am facing, what life throws at me, Jesus is enough. No matter what I'm facing or what situation I am, I'm in. Or how dark it gets. The context here is that Jesus is enough. J.B. Phillips has this great translation of this verse. I love it. He says, the way he translates is, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. I want to pause again. Soak it in. He says, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. That is more of a, theolo- more of a theological definition of 413. So, this is the secret church. I, I, I'm coming to a close to Paul's contentment. He is tethered to Christ, and Christ is enough. It's interesting, the Greek word that Paul uses for contentment, he uses it in 2 Corinthians 9. It's the same word in Philippians 4, and it means all sufficiency. One of my points I want you to leave with today is true contentment is resting in the all sufficiency of Christ. True contentment believes, as Philippians 4.19 says, that, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Is that good news for anyone in this church? Because it's good news for my heart and my soul. True content is resting in the all-sufficiency of Christ. Hear me, church. Truly contented Christians will find their need for love in the love of Christ. Truly contented Christians will find their acceptance in the acceptance of the Almighty God. Truly contented Christians will find their need for security safe in the Father's arms. If our source of discontentment is that we elevate things above God, then our source of contentment is recognizing that Jesus is enough. He's enough for you. He's enough for me. And church, this is not denying pain. Contentment isn't like putting your fingers in your ear, acting like everything's okay. No, it's in the middle of your struggle. You recognize that Christ is enough good for me. I want to close um, with the story I heard of this English pastor. His name was Alan Redpath, and he has this phrase, worship band, you could start to come. One of the mantras of this man's life was when he was studying the passages that we have been studying, and the Lord spoke to him these, this phrase, for this I have Jesus. And as he studied, this became the mantra of his life, this phrase, for this I have Jesus. And he would hand out bookmarks to everyone in church, people that were going through divorces, people that had physical ailments, people that were depressed and had anxiety issues. And he would give them bookmarks that said, for this I have Jesus. And as I read about him, At age 92, he had a stroke, and the church went to visit him. He could hardly speak, and his face was paralyzed. 
And they asked him, how are you doing, Alan? And he said, for this I have Jesus. He said, I served the Lord as a young man, and now I'm an old man, but for this I have Jesus. And I want to close with this. I don't know what you came in here facing. I don't know what challenge you're looking at, but I want you to hear this. Whatever it is, you can say, for this I have Jesus. You with me, church? And I want you to be able to leave church today, and I want you to be able to apply this to your situation, it, that, that no matter what happens, because I have a friend two days ago that got in a head-on wreck, and his dog died, and two people on the road, they died instantly. And I want to call him, and I want to say to him, for this you have Jesus. It's not just for when everything's going great, and the church is growing and everyone's happy and 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 things are going it's it's when things aren't going well it's when the enemy's got his foot on your throat and your anxiety is coming out i want you to say this phrase for this i have jesus and if you can leave here to church and apply that to your situation for this i have jesus he's enough and he's the secret would you bow your heads and pray with me Father, I am so absolutely grateful for this sermon today. I'm thankful for the word of God. And I pray for those that are searching right now, much like myself before I found Christ. And the faster they're running for more, the emptier they feel. Jesus says it's time to come off the hamster wheel. What you're looking for is me. And for those that are out there that are going through a trial or an obstacle and you don't understand, for this I have Jesus. For a marriage that is ripe on the brink of divorce, for this I have Jesus. For a business that is failing. For financial ruin. For this I have Jesus. And I pray that in the wonderful name of Christ. And all of God's people said. Would you stand up and would you, let's worship the Lord.